Welcome to another edition of Lab Matters, a webcast from Kaspersky Lab. I'm here to talk about a very interesting topic with a very interesting researcher in our uh, global research and analysis team, Mr. Ruhl Schauenberg. Ruhl has been tracking the Stuxnet worm and the ramifications of this attack very closely. And I want to start off right off the bat with just can you give me just a general, uh, a general high level overview of uh, what Stuxnet is? Uh, well, there are lots of aspects to Stuxnet. So, first of all, Stuxnet is a worm, and as we found out um, quite recently, a couple of weeks before the Virus Bulletin Conference, mm -hmm. um, Stuxnet's end goal is to sabotage uh, certain devices that you will most likely find at power plants and, and general factories. Right. Um, and it does this using very, very sophisticated techniques because these networks that it's ultimately targeting are disconnected from the internet. Right. Give me, give me a, uh, an example of what you mean by sophisticated techniques. What, is, what are we finding in Stuxnet that it's not uh, in use in like general purpose malware? Uh, well, if you just look at the, the, the first big thing about Stuxnet is really that Stuxnet exploited four zero-day vulnerabilities. And any malware exploiting one previously unknown vulnerability is already quite big news. Two would have been unprecedented. This is four. So that, and that's just on the, on the Windows side of things. So that's really, really big. Right. And the, the eventual target, like you said, was uh, you know, software that runs these uh, industri potential industrial plants, uh, a lot mm -hmm, of uh, mm -hmm. critical infrastructure, perhaps. Uh, a lot of that stuff is not connected to the internet. Um, so how, how, how exactly does the worm propagate and what are some of the main propagation techniques? Uh, so the worm can propagate using uh, USB devices, so mm -hmm. USB sticks, as well as uh, spread across the network using MS-08067 and uh, a shared uh, printer uh, spool of vulnerability, uh, which is now patched in MS-10061. Right. Do we have any evidence at all that um, uh, where what's the origin of this attack and who the eventual targets were, or do we, or is it all just speculation? Now? And that's a very good question. There are some things in inside the worm code that could potentially be considered as evidence leading to something. From my point of view, it's not evidence at all. It could well be stuff that's left in there to send us on a wild goose chase. Mm -hmm. So. So far, it's all speculation, and I really think that unless somebody steps forward and claims responsibility for Stuxnet, we will never, ever find out who's behind it. But it's clear that this is uh, uh, the attackers or whoever is behind the creation and, and release of Stuxnet is, and, and you said this publicly already, uh, enjoy some sort of nation state backing. And the resources, talk a little bit about what your <coughs> thoughts are regarding the actual resources that are built, that, that, that was used to build, build into this thing. Oh, yeah, so Stuxnet is very sophisticated, as I was already mentioning, and it has a whole lot of novel things inside the code. So we, you really need a team probably from five to ten people who are really top-level experts uh, in their field to find all these different vulnerabilities, know how to work with these industrial control systems and all that stuff. And there has, must have been months and months of development, as well as testing. Because this is such a complex thing, th there has to be lots of testing. Mm -hmm. They need to be sure that it works cor correctly. With that in mind, and the fact that it's uh, ultimately cyber sabotage and not cyber espionage, right. um, n n nation state backing is the, the only likely or the most likely uh, right. uh, scenario. You said cyber sabotage. Do we know what the end goal was or uh, uh, is there any sort of uh, evidence in the code or any sort of pointers in the code that tells us what the attackers may have done or, 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 or was, was trying to do? Well, the, the, the problem for us is we don't have the exact machinery, don't have the exact specifications of the hardware, nor do we know the exact configuration that the hardware would be in. So that's very hard. So but it's impossible to really test and figure yes, out exactly what they were trying to do. The people at INL, uh, which is the, I, don't, I forgot the ac what the acronym stands for exactly, but this is a, a U.S. national R&D with regards to industrial control systems, they had set up a test grid for Stuxnet mm -hmm. and they deployed Stuxnet in this test network and they had machines overload. Um, so, so that's definitely one uh, right. 
a potential scenario, but that doesn't give us 100% certainty that that is also exactly what would happen in the wild. We heard from Microsoft here at the Virus Bulletin conference that uh, Stuxnet, there's, there's evidence that Stuxnet or some parts of the code dates back to January 2009. Uh, we, uh, the first public documentation of this thing mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. as some sort of, you know, industrial strength malware uh, came maybe July this year. Uh, and, and a lot of the research has come subsequent to that. Do we have any evidence that this was this actually officially dates back to how far? How, do you know? Do we know how far Stuxnet itself dates back, dates back to? And just to wrap up quickly, can you talk a little bit about uh, you know what where we're seeing the infections and and whether whether it's under control if it's continuing to spread? Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, well, f uh, to tackle the first part of your question, what what we've seen indeed is that there are some hints in the code, like compiler dates and so on, that, that point, at least for the initial variant, uh, to the beginning of uh, last year, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that variant uh, remained under the radar for a very, for very long, long time, right. only since we s uh, saw the more sophisticated version, we found out, hey, there is this more, uh, this, there is this older variant. Um, having said that, um, and the fact that the two of these zero-day vulnerabilities aren't quite as zero-day as we first right. thought is, is very interesting. For, given the, 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 um, the clues in the code, I would say, that estimating everything, this project probably started in 2008 when they were first designing it and they must have had right. a, quite, quite a plan on, on how to deploy it. The worm continues to spread today? Uh, yes, definitely, because it's a worm that spreads on its own. It doesn't await any command from its master. It just keeps on spreading. So while well, initially in July we saw the majority of attacks, or majority of infections, I should say, in Iran, right now we see the most in, uh, in India and Indonesia, right. and the amount of uh, infections in Iran has actually uh, decreased. Because of disinfections and... and, and Post yeah, cleanup, yeah, based on yeah, cleanups. And yes, all. yes. Um, just to end quickly with, uh, what should uh, uh, an industrial network with a scale environment that might be under attack think about? How should uh, how should those network administrators think about defending themselves against Stuxnet type attacks? What are some of the you know top three things that they absolutely should be on top of? Uh, well, that's a very because it's zero day. I mean, how do it, you defend? It's a, a, a very tough questions because a, a lot of these networks run on uh, more out of date uh, hardware, and the, 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 these uh, systems have uh, certain hardware limitations. So, in some doc uh, documentation, actually says, please do not enable automatic update of antivirus. Right, right. So that's definitely not good. But other than like a good patch management, it really makes sense to have good intrusion detection systems as well as honeypots. If you uh, have a, if you ha have a fake PLC in your network that you are able to monitor, monitor right. that then you are able to determine very very quickly that right. something is wrong. So a lot of the traditional defenses can work for this type of... Oh, I, 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 th I think actually that that's very much the case. Um, if you take even, let's say, consumer antivirus uh, product, it has a lot of uh, additional features that aren't enabled mm -hmm. by default because they are maybe not as user-friendly. But w when you're on these critical, inf uh, critical networks, mm -hmm. you can really uh, crank up uh, certain uh, settings because there will be no legitimate use for, for certain operations happening in these limited, very right. controlled. You expect uh, this to be a story we'll be talking about for the next year? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think that will greatly depend on if we see more of this happening. Thank you very much, Rol. Very, very interesting information. My and pleasure. thank you for watching another edition of our Lab Matters podcast. Thank you.